church uh, Christmas program. We appreciate you taking time to come out on a, a rainy night. We, we'll try to keep you as dry as possible while the program goes on. Just a couple of announcements quickly. Restrooms are to the rear back here if you have to go. The program isn't that long, so maybe you can avoid that. If you have a child, we don't have a staff nursery tonight, but the nursery is up the ramp and through the door over here to the right. So, uh, or you would go to the left and into the right as you go through the up the ramp. So, if you have a child that needs uh, attention, we would ask you to uh, consider everyone else and uh, take them to the nursery. We appreciate you being here. We're not in the entertainment business around here. We're in the Jesus business, and, and uh, we're not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We're we're glad for a gospel that, that, that tells the story. And uh, it's the good news today. If you're here and you're lost, you're a special guest. We appreciate your presence. And we'll appreciate your patience uh, through the scene. We have young people first. And then uh, the main play will be put on. It's not, as I said, it isn't very long. So uh, we want to thank you once again for coming. If you bow your heads with me, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer, open it up, and then the play program will begin. Father, we bless you for this good day, for who you are, what you've done. God, uh, 2,000 years ago, you come in the form of a baby and was born in a manger in Bethlehem. And God, you was born to die for our sin. We thank you for that, that you lived a sinless life. And oh God, you died on an old rugged cross. But you rose the third day, praise the Lord forever. Soon coming back for those of yours, God, that have called and believed and trusted you as Savior. So we pray that you'd bless each one that's in the program. And that the hand of God would be upon this and the blessing of the Lord would be about it. We pray, God, that if there's lost folk, that before they leave this building tonight, they'd call on the name of the Lord and be gloriously saved. We know, God, that it's, not a, that it's not a laughing matter. It's the most serious thing we face in our lives. So I pray the sweet Holy Spirit have His way. And Lord, we bid You come and do Your work. We'll praise You today, tomorrow, and forever for all You do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude 
of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace through the will toward men. Christmas program, huh? Yeah, I know a little bit about Christmas programs. I got dragged to a few of those myself. What was it this time? The little ones come out, do their thing. They have their letters like, C is for Christmas, and all that. Well, now you've got me. My name's Bob. And tonight, I'm going to tell you the story of my life. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. And you're right. I'm nobody special. Just a simple, everyday man born to simple, everyday folks. And I learned pretty early on that if I just want to have anything in this life, I'd have to work hard for it. And that's pretty much what I've done. And my folks, they were good people. They brought me up right. They weren't what you call the religious type. No, my granny, she was religious enough for all of us. She'd pester us half to death to come to church with her. Come to this program, come to this scene, come to this dinner. One thing after another. And every now and then, we'd give in and go just to get her to hush for a spell. But now Christmas, yeah, Christmas was Granny's time. It was the same thing every year. She'd open up her old Bible. I'd have to sit still and quiet while she found a Christmas story. She made sure that I never moved a muscle until and thought about opening up those presents until she'd read us that Christmas story. She'd read that story to me, and you know, I could almost see all the people she read about. I could tell you that whole story by heart. I've heard it so many times. And it came, came to pass, pass in those days, days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Bobby, that baby was Jesus. He was born to be your Savior. I love you, Bobby. Of course, she wasn't through until she told us all about the baby in the manger, the shepherds and the angels. She said she wanted to make sure that I knew what Christmas was all about. And I thought I did. It was about getting her to hurry up and hush so I could open up all my presents. But, no, you know, Granny, she was a real good woman. Very sincere. I mean, she really believed everything that she was reading about. And I know that. And every year was the same thing. She read that same old story out of her Bible like it was brand new every single time. Why, I could almost hear the angel singing the way she read it. And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And there shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Those angels knew that Jesus was the Savior of the world. He came to die for our sins. Don't ever forget that. I love you, Bobby. And that's how it went until I was a teenager. She just kept telling that same old story until she couldn't tell anything anymore. I remember the last time she had me come and sit down at her feet while she told me that old story by Harsh. And you know... I could tell that story still meant just as much to her as it always did. And it came to pass in the days as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go in, even into Bethlehem and see these things which come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby laying in the manger. <coughs> And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they had heard it wondered but at those things which were told them in the, by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Bobby, don't ever forget what Jesus has done for you. He was born into this world to be your Savior, to save you from your sins. He loves you and He wants to be your Savior. I'm praying every day, Bobby, that you'll accept Him. I love you, Bobby. When Granny said that, I got this strange feeling. My cold chills running down my back. You know, it's like I knew what she was saying was right, but I just didn't know what to do about it. I just shook her off and I told Granny, you know, don't worry about me. <coughs> well, <coughs> Granny died just a few months after that last Christmas. Well, you know, she ended up getting me in church by keeping the boat. <laughs> they had her funeral at a church house instead of a funeral home like normal people. And I was one of the pallbearers. So. Boy, that was the strangest thing, let me tell you. Nothing at all like what you'd expect. <coughs> Oh, people were crying all right. But you know, they were crying in the middle of laughing. They were raising their hands up and shouting and carrying on, making all kinds of commotion. <laughs> You'd have thought those people had won the lottery by all the noise they were making. And that preacher, why, he fit right in there with them. Not at all solemn like you'd think. No, he preached like a regular old church service. He went on and on about seeing Granny again in heaven. And you know, there for a little while... <coughs> I wondered if I'd ever see Granny again. A little voice inside told me that I needed Jesus for that. I just shook it off again. I decided I'd avoid church just as much as possible after that. But now, I've always been a good man as far as that goes. You know, I never drank or anything like that. I always tried to do right by people. I'd seen way too many people act all holy and Jesus-loving on Sunday mornings. And then they were like snakes in the grass the rest of the week. And my life's always been better than that. To me, that's always been good enough. When Kim and I got married and had kids, I brought them up right. I taught them to be good people, to treat others with respect, to do the right thing. You know, I didn't figure I needed some preacher up there telling me how to live right teaching me how to raise up my kids. And I feel like I did a pretty good job on my own without anybody else's help. Well, we had some neighbors start taking their kids to church with them on Sunday mornings. You know, at first I wasn't too keen on the idea, but Tyler and Alyssa, they loved it. They couldn't wait for that knock on the door come Sunday morning. <laughs> be honest with you, the quiet mornings without the kids were kind of nice, so I let them go. Sure, they invited me and the wife too, but after a few good no's, they got the picture. They left me alone. 
But now Tyler wasn't going to church too awfully long. Maybe a few months. Before he came running in the house with big news, he said. He ran right up in front of me. Got in front of me and the TV and blocked the ball game I was watching. Started jabbering on how he got saved, he got saved. I turned down the volume and looked at him and said, Well, that's good, son. I sure am proud of you. Even though I didn't really like what he was talking about. He told me he was getting baptized the next Sunday night. And then the next thing he said, well, it just plain made me mad. He settled down, looked at me and said, Daddy, don't you want to get saved so you can get baptized with me next Sunday night? And then we can all go to heaven together. Well, you'd have thought Granny had raised up from the dead and put words in that boy's mouth. <laughs> that boy spoke inside me and told me he was right. I just clenched my teeth and said, Son, don't you worry about me. Your daddy will be just fine. Now let me get back to my ball game. Oh, he looked a little bit down. But then he turned to his mama, put her through the same thing. Before I knew it, Alyssa came in with the same news. She got saved. Wouldn't you know it, those kids even talked their mama into going to church with them. You probably guessed what happened next. Yeah. She got saved and baptized too. Then I remember one Sunday afternoon, Kim came home all serious and solemn. She sat down and looked at me and said, Bob, the kids and I love you and we want you to go to heaven with us. And the only way that you can do that is if you accept Jesus as your Savior. Won't you please ask Him into your heart? Boy, I was so mad I could have spit nails. But she was so humble and sincere, I couldn't rant and rave at her like I wanted to. And that voice told me she was right. I needed Jesus. I just shook my head and said, Kim, honey, don't you know I've tried my very best to be a good husband and a good daddy? Don't you know I've got a good heart and I've tried to do right? She just nodded her head as the tears rolled down her cheeks. I said, Kim, honey, don't worry about not seeing me in heaven and all of that. And that's how it went for the next few years. Sure, for the most part, you know, we all got along just fine. Every now and then, Kim or Alyssa, they would say something to me about getting saved or tell me they were praying for me. But it just took a harsh word or a stern look to touch them up. Tyler, though, that boy was a different story. I kept thinking maybe he'd grow out of it. But it seemed like the older he got, the more he wanted to talk about Jesus. I'm not sure. Uh, we'd watch sports together or NASCAR or something like that, but I got the feeling like maybe he was just trying to humor me. You know, keep the lines of communication open. He'd sit down and watch the news with me and he'd say, You know, Dad, the Bible says, especially if there was a story about a war or an earthquake or something like that. Well... One day he came in and he told me that God had called him to preach. I was so shocked I didn't know what to say. So I just sat there. He told me that he was going to be preaching his first message the next Sunday night. He said, Dad, it would mean the world to me if you'd come hear me preach my first sermon. Will you come? I started giving my usual no. Get on out of here. Let me get back to TV. But you know, I didn't do that. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go. And you know what? I believe I shocked myself just about as much as I shocked him.
Well, I went with my family to church house that night. So when the pastor introduced Tyler, I half expected him to get up and bolt out the door. But he didn't. He walked right up there. And you know, when he opened his mouth, he spoke like a man. I was totally in awe of my son. I sure didn't understand how that was my boy standing up there, speaking so clearly, strongly, and boldly. He preached about how Jesus is the only way to heaven. He said that nothing we could ever do would be good enough to earn a place there. Well, I'd heard all that before, but you know, this time, it sounded different. He said that Jesus came to die as a sacrifice for our sins. He said that Jesus raised Himself from the dead. And all we have to do to make heaven our home to just believe in Him. He said that without the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins, we'd all die and go to hell. You know, I don't think I moved a muscle as he preached that message. And before I knew it, the music was playing softly in the background. All those things that Tyler had said, they were ringing and echoing in my head. I just kept thinking... Maybe I'm not good enough. And then that voice began to speak inside me. That same voice I'd heard before. Only this time it was clearer, stronger than it had been. Kept saying, you're running out of time. I heard Tyler say, is your heart beating out of your chest? You hear a voice inside you begging you to come to the altar? He said, that's the Holy Spirit inviting you to come to give your life to Jesus to accept His free gift of salvation. Please come. I decided I'd just sit still. This will all be over soon. I told that voice to hush. I'm not going to go. That voice spoke to me again and said, you're running out of time. I heard Tyler say, Please come to this altar. Let Jesus take over. And I heard that voice inside me say again, This is your last chance. Go now. So my feet moved, and I stepped out into that aisle.
night changed my life. I finally found that peace my family kept telling me about. Jesus was the answer to my problems and all of my questions. You know, I finally understood that being good was never going to be good enough. And Jesus was simply the only answer. My son baptized me a few days after that. And the next weeks were the happiest me and my family had ever known. I talked to my family, my friends, my co-workers, everyone I could about what happened to me. I didn't understand everything, but I wanted to learn all that I could. And it seemed like the more I learned, the more I wanted to tell everyone else. It's like I couldn't shut up. But then three weeks after that wonderful day, I woke up in the middle of the night with a crushing pain in my chest. And I tried to reach for Kim. And I tried to call her name. But I couldn't catch my breath. And that's the last thing that I remember. Tyler preached my funeral. And the tears flowed like a river. Kim didn't look like she could take another step. My son had to stop several times to pull himself together. But you know, as hard as it was for them to say goodbye, my family had that reassurance that they would see me again because I didn't wait until it was too late. They knew that I had a new life in the Lord and that death was only the beginning. They went on with their lives, waiting for the day that they would see me again in heaven. to you but I can't because you see I'm not there that's the way that my story should have gone that's how I forever wish it had gone but that's not what happened this is what happened
my story really went. Something inside me died that day. Like a tiny struggling flame got snuffed out. I felt cold and dead inside. I even tried praying again. Asking God for that same drawing power that was so much more than I could bear that day. But it never again came. I went to church every chance I could after that. Still nothing. That crushing pain in my chest, it did come though. And Tyler did preach my funeral. But my family was heartbroken beyond words as they watched that coffin being lowered into the ground. They had no hope of ever seeing me again. That one moment, that one decision made the difference in forever for me. I will forever wish I had taken a step toward God that day instead of away from Him. If I could, I would go back and change that one eternally fatal mistake. If I could, I would rewrite the story of my life. If I could, I would stand before you and beg you not to make the same mistakes that I've made. Because you see, this is the Christmas play that will forever and ever play in my mind. I'll have eternity to wish I could come back and change my story. But you still have time. You can change your story. You can change your eternity. But mine is carved in history now. Sister, you'll play something soft on the end. The Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse number 16. Everybody in this room knows this verse. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, put your name in there, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We hear this story over and over. Christmas comes every year. You know, we put on a program and we try to convince people that there's only one way to heaven. You're not going to accidentally fall into that place. Jesus told Nicodemus, a learned man, he said, you must be born again. Friend, you'll never get there apart from that. And year after year, we put on these programs, and you know what? People walk out that door. They could have rewritten or changed their story, but their story will end. They leave without Christ. Sunday after Sunday, people sit in their pews in this very church. We give an invitation every Sunday. You know what they say? They shake my hand as they go out the door. Some say, good message, preacher. Some don't say anything. But many, I know by their own confession, is lost without Christ. And they pay no mind. There's coming a day when Jesus is coming back. And if He doesn't come back in our lifetime, there's coming a day when like this man, you may feel a crushing pain in your chest. You may be driving down in a four-lane highway in an automobile veer from the other side. Brother Donald Wattenberger says you're six feet from death every time you meet an oncoming car. People do that without a thought in their mind. You know what we tried to present tonight? The fact that one man's story, this is one man. You want to know something unique about this? In 2007, I think it was, when this program was put on, the man that told that story tonight left here a lost man. He heard this program. He heard Brother Robert Wagner play that part. He heard the story told. And Brother David Andreessen walked out that door, a lost man that night, doubting the truth and ignoring the power of God. But God was gracious. His mercy endureth forever and He's long-suffering. <laughs> and one glorious night in a meeting, the Holy Spirit dealt with Dave's heart and he comes sliding under an altar and called upon the name of the Lord and the Lord glorified.
gloriously saved him. He come behind the podium that night and said, The Lord hath saved me. <laughs> Tonight he tells the story. He made the choice. His eternity is different now. What's your eternity? I'll have a lot of other times to try it, preacher. No, you might not. I've heard this story all my life. That may be true. I'll have an upper, another opportunity. Are you sure? Why don't you come tonight? You know what we've done? We put carpet down on the floor to kneel on. We put an old mortar's bench on each side of these stairs. You'll never have an easier time to call upon the name of the Lord and be gloriously saved than you will right now. The story of the granny telling that every year remind me of mine. I'd never leave her door. She'd say, Michael. Most call me Mike. Granny called me. She'd, when she was serious, it was Michael. Michael, I'm praying for. believe that tonight. Come to see a little Christmas program. Make you feel good. Get you in the holiday spirit. We've challenged you. What are you going to do with eternity? What are you going to do with today? You know what the rich man said? He said, send Lazarus. He might dip his finger, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He said, for I'm torment in this flame. You see, that part's as true as the baby being born in this manger. He said, I got five brethren. Would you send somebody to talk to them? He said, let Lazarus come back and talk to my brothers. Jesus said, Brothers, have Moses and the prophets. Let him hear them. He said, Yea, Lord, but if one just rose from the dead, he said, If they won't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe, though one be raised from the dead. That's where a lot of people said tonight. They won't, be, they won't believe, though one has raised from the dead. I'm glad he found me when I was dead. I'm glad He gave me eternal life. I'm glad the sweet Spirit of God drew me to Him. Is He drawing you tonight? Could I invite you to come? As the choir sings that first verse of that song again, would you come? Would you come to an altar of prayer? How close are you? This building's 90 feet. So that means you're less than 75 feet away. Say, so I'll do it right here, preacher. No, you won't. If you won't come here, you won't do it there. The preacher preached a revival service. He gave an invitation. The girl was weeping in the back. He went back to her. He said, would you be saved? She said, I will if I can do it right here. He said, you can't do it here. He come back up front. The next night, the girl was in the service, weeping again. The preacher went back to her, said, would you be saved tonight? She said, I will if I can do it right here. He said, you can't do it right here. Come back up front. Third night, went back. The girl's still weeping. The preacher goes back to her. And she said, preacher, I've got to be saved. I don't care if I have to go up front. I don't care if I have to run around the building. I don't care what it takes. I need a Savior. And I need to call upon the Lord. Lord, my preacher, let's go up front. I'll do it. He said, you can do it right here. You see, it's getting to the place where you don't care where they're at. You don't care who's around. You know you're lost and on the road to hell and you need to be saved. And you're looking for a place to call on the Lord. You can call on Him tonight. 
You can be saved right now. Would you be saved? While we stand up tonight and they sing this song, sing it here.